Hello, my name's Karen, otherwise known as Fred and Eva's mum. I'm also one of the directors of Tour Like Me. Uh, I just wanted to come on today to share with you my journey and how important um, my, my work and my play has been for my mental health and well-being. So I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to go through a little bit of a um, PowerPoint, if that's okay. So here we go. I've called it with the help of um, Charlotte give me this title, Proactive for Positivity. So as you can see here, here's my son, Fred. He's the reason I'm here. Um, I just wanted to set the scene first. Um, we were living in London, um, having a great time. I thought I'd better have children, I'm nearing 40. And so um, I had Eva, and luckily I met um, a group of like-minded women in the centre of London. We met at Soho Baby Club. It was next to a lap dancing club, and that's what happens in London. Um, but these women were really, really important to me, and um, that's and even more important now, I would say. Um, this is us um, in Soho with Fred as he was a, a little one. And right from the start, even before I had children, I've always believed that children's voices should be heard and their rights was respected. And in all the work I did, I even started um, being a play work at like age 12 or something, volunteering at a play scheme. And from then, I've always worked within the children's sector. I've worked across all sectors, public, I worked with local government, charitable, um, play charities, outdoor play charities, and private in terms of um, children's media and TV. I used to work with the tenants, which was great fun. As I look back, all of those roles have enabled me to be to further those beliefs in whatever sector. So, as I alluded to before, I co-founded Twill Like Me, and I'm also the co-author of the RNI Day Let's Play Guide, which I'll mention in a little. My most challenging and rewarding and important job, of course, is to be more to Eva, who's 12, and Fred, who's 11, looks a bit bigger than that now, um, who's severely visually impaired. So the scene, as I said, in London, um, literally fresh shot out, um, very quick in that way. Um, um, the six-week check, um, sorry about that bank, on the six-week check, um, I went to the doctors, not too, not too worried, really. Um, you know, he's a second child, so yes, he's feeding well, yes, he's um, eating and he weighs okay. But I was a little bit concerned about the wobbly eyes, which I now know is in stack. Um, luckily, I had a really good GP who sent us to the eye clinic straight away, so I had no time to worry. Um, and then within three months, we'd been to Great Ormond Street, we'd been to Moorfields, and we'd had a diagnosis of um, a rare condition called FEVR, familiar exudative trio retinal. Um, and he was registered as severely sight impaired. Um, he was registered at Moorfields, and I remember just walking out of the uh, hospital. They gave us a space blanket, you know, those big silver blankets. It was a really heavy developmental journey. And I did feel very heavy, like, with a very heavy heart. And we hated the space blankets, it was far too noisy. <laughs> but that was our sort of path to diagnosis. And I'm really thankful that it was very, it was very quick because um, it enabled us to move on that step and further and to be believed, really. But as we all know, that step from diagnosis really takes, takes it out of you. So I've labelled this slide from tragedy to positivity, because um, we all think of tragedy in our life, not. Um, I like to think of the journey from diagnosis, and I like to reflect on it, and I like to see how far we've come. Um, but at the time, it didn't feel like that at all. Obviously, when everybody gets a shock diagnosis, I've not had any real experience with um, people visually impaired in my family or friends. So obviously, when we get that shock, it feels shock. You know, it's, it's I tried to look at this as a cocktail. So a slug of shock, you know, there's that sort of shock that makes you say you can't swallow. And, you know, that denial, don't the denial, it can't be. No, no, it must be happening to somebody else. Somebody else. And that feeling of tragedy, um, I hate to use the T word now because I can't believe that I didn't think that my little bundle of joy would be anything but adorable. Now I did feel it was a tragedy. I can even remember crying down the phone to my friends, you know, big people crying, saying, my dad died at 18, that was my tragedy. <laughs> How dare I have another one in my life? As if, you know, you're only allowed one. Um, so accepting that I thought 
treatment, her life was quite tragic, it's quite difficult, but I'm glad to say I moved on from that. That angry, I'm really angry, it's whiny and fair and pity. I, you know, I hate to say it now, but I felt I really needed to be pitied, I felt helpless. Um, I felt really out there on my own, and I suppose really drowning in that sort of overwhelm, overwhelming feeling of hopelessness. However, I think once you've drank all of that potion and experienced it and it's gone round in your tummy and mixing on it, I'd say in about a year, I digested it. And then I would ask myself now, how do I feel then? And I realise now that I felt really hungry, really hungry for information. I wanted more information, I wanted more learning, I wanted more knowledge. Luckily for us, we lived really close to the RNIB in Church Street. So um, I wandered in there one day, not particularly feeling very happy, fed in a carrier because he wouldn't be put down at all. So I carried him for nine minutes and then I literally carried him for nine minutes. Um, and I just happened to bump into a woman at reception and I sort of mumbled something about blind baby. This is my world now, I guess. And luckily for me, she took me around the shop and gave me the toy the play guide. Um, I didn't know how important that was going to be to me, but it was. And it was, it was important then because when people asked, well, what do I buy him? You know, seeing his, you know, got funny eyes. I could sort of say, oh, look, these are these toys that have been recommended. So it was really helpful for me at that time. Um, and, but that wasn't enough. I still had that uncontrollable urge to do something. Um, so I signed up for a Partners in Learning course from RNIB that the lady had told me about. And I remember the guy saying, oh, you can't do that. You're not a TA. I said, oh, yes, I can, actually. I really want to learn. I want to be with people that know more about this. And that was a great course. Um, it was an online course with a couple of um, um, day, day, day in person meets. Um, and that was great. I, I understand now that R and I they do actually have a parents one, which I highly recommend anybody doing, because I think having that knowledge, you do feel a little bit more powerful in that way. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was tough because, you know, you're there, but it was really worth it. And those bits of information um, helped me to think, actually, I can do this. Um, I can enjoy my child and I can learn with him um, in his way. It's not a tragedy. Um, it's just a different way. Um, and I can, those courses and the information that I received and the support that we got um, in, you know, accessing um, a family centre and things like that, help me live in the moment and let me, let Fred take the lead. Um, really, because I think that's well done. Says there somewhere inside us is the power to change the world, and I think we do have that. I remember one of the things I was really worried about um, looking into the future because I said, like him having friends, how will he have friends? He won't be able to see them. Oh, and this is a picture of him now, uh, then in his um, first year at school um, with his friends that he's still friends with now. Um, he's there, he's one of the gang, he's in our local park. So, you know, I like to look back on those pictures and think yes you know it, it was all right it was difficult we had all those emotions and it's important to own those emotions and do something with it so that's how i felt that i turned my tragedy into positivity getting a bit more information and doing something proactive and that's not the same for everyone is it really i mean my tonic i found as i've reflected back is feeling connected i need to feel connected so um, I need to feel connected to friends. So that group of women that I met when Eva was born became very, very important. And then particularly one, one woman, woman that I'll talk to you about, I need to be connected to information, learning, Facebook groups. I wanted to be out there and that helped me. It might not help you, but being connected helped me. And being emotionally connected, having to be able to name those emotions, really important and acknowledge your feelings. But, you need to find out what yours are, um, what are your triggers. You know, I hate the pity stare. You know, that's a trigger for me. I can slot with somebody when I get our oh, bless, you know, but that's that's my trigger and I'm dealing with it. And the other thing that I realised what my tonic was, was creative output. I've always been a playful person, I worked with children. So um, being creative has become my 
um, route to well-being, I would say. And I was just going to spend a little bit of time talking about these four um, creative out, outpourings that I've had. So the first one um, was Book Trust. I was really, I thought I was doing okay. And then I looked at this pile of shiny books in the corner, you know, the early years, bright ones. I thought, what you said, I was to read, you know, because I've been a tactile learner. Um, and I looked around for tactile books, and I was so fed up and reading that's not my dinosaur, it's tales to whatever. Um, and I actually phoned Book Trust up, who does the, you know, the book start um, packs. And I said, have you got any ideas for any really good quality tactile books? And she said, no, actually, um, we, we, we've had trouble filling the book touch packs. So um, have you got any ideas? Would you want to be part of making a new one? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. So here we have Fred um, reading. And actually, there's a video if you want to play it um, later. Um, what do you think now? Yes. Yeah, so if you can see him. He's actually going through the sample book. So it's a gate. So he's not yet two yet. Daddy. And so he's we received this book in this form and it would go backwards and forwards. And Fred would be the expert. So if he didn't understand what it was, then it would go back and we would have um, another go. And this was all based on our trip to the park of the photo. There we go. So this was Fred being an expert researcher. Um, and that helped me and Fred in create these books here. So off to the park, this is what it became. Uh, it was a great process because it helped me learn. And um, this is him, the book trust invited us um, to launch got his own copy. And it made me realize that there were so many ways to read. And I needn't worry about that. Um, this is me creating some books apps for Fred. This is him reading his connect. And obviously during lockdown, this was his setup with his braille and his connect and everything else he needs. So here's the most well read of us all. And I like to look back on that and think, you know, there are lots of ways to read, so I need to be read. I mentioned the RNIV play in Toy Guide um, when I think of how, how useful it was to me. And I've had a really good positive um, impact with RNIV. You know, I've had a good communication with them. The lady that I bumped in to happened to be the head of children's, and I kept in touch with her. And they invited me down to do some positive impact, you know, how was RNIV? impacted in your life. So I was wheeled out as a parent, as a good parent. And at the end of that meeting, they asked me if I'd like to um, rewrite the Aaron Abbey toy play guide, which I thought was amazing. It was the first piece of paid work I had received after having after having fed. And it made me feel worth of work. It made me feel worthwhile and valuable. And it helps me get back into work. And also what's great about it is it's helped others too. Um, and like I said, the, the, um, the site loss course that R and um, is running now, I would highly recommend it. So that turning point, was it was connecting and it was also creative, going right back to the things that I needed. Around that time as well, we recognised, me and my friend Rebecca recognised that there were very, very few toys that looked like uh, children with disabilities. I just want to spend a little bit of time just telling you about how I met Rebecca. Um, Rebecca um, was one of our mums. She had an older a son, like my daughter, and um, she happened to be the first person that I bumped into after my friend out had um, was visually impaired. Floods of tears, you imagine it. Oh, my God, my child, can't see. Um, I already knew um, Rebecca was deaf because she wore hearing aids. Um, that's all I knew. Um, and I said, what am I going to do with my child blind? She went to me. She gave me a big hug, first of all, don't worry, she said, I can't see either. I said, what? She said, she had, she's got issues. She's got um, RP in her eyes, you know, and she has a progressive eye, eyesight loss. She said, I can't see. 
are they anything? She said, no. And that particularly is because every time she um, looked for her son and couldn't find him, he was just underneath her here because she had tunnel vision. She couldn't see anywhere other than where she was looking. And I always thought she was a bit, a bit clumsy. You know, she always ran over my feet with her buggy. And that's why. And I didn't know. But I said to her then, how can you be visually impaired? I said, well, my best friends, you, you're a great journalist, you're a great writer, media professional. How? And she just looked at me and said, yeah. And that I'll go back to that point so many times because it put me in my place in the best possible way that you can just can be. And she's, she's Fred's godmother. Um, and she's also my business partner and my best friend. And I think that's really important to have those people in your life that can. So we set up Toy Lovely, um, um, which is, we started off as a campaign to um, create more toys that were positively represented of disability. If you've ever been to the family centres, you've seen the, the sort of chewed toys in the corner. They usually go on in the wheelchair, with one with a gammy leg, or one with dark glasses. We wanted to change that. So what we tried to do is show people what could be done. So here we have Tink, um, Tinkerbell, and Rebecca put a little cochlear implant in a little prestige. And that image, you wouldn't believe, just went viral. I, I was sent to Smith's Toys to buy 20 more Tinks so she could make them. I'm still known, still known in Smith's Toys as the Tinkerbell lady. And we created these and we, we, we distributed them. And uh, we realised then that there was a real need. We stopped after 20 because we were really scared that Disney would sue us or something. And that actually, it wasn't our job to make toys. It was the big boys' job to make toys. And I'm really pleased to say that they are doing it. You've seen the Barbies in the wheelchair and the indifference and the Tiger. Um, so I think things are moving. And I'd like to think that we have a little bit of um, an influence in that because what we try and do is to create loads of different projects that are playful around disability. We try and influence and we also educate our own workshops that have been virtual recently. So representation, representation does matter. I think if you get, um, and you know, that pain of recognition when a child sees that doll or that image, like it's fantastic. So lots of dolls have been great. Um, it was Rebecca's dream that she would have a deaf doll, and this was the first doll that Lottie made that had a visual disability. And ever since, moved into autism and worked with his fine young chap, Hayden, and developed a doll that we would have liked. Um, so there are, there are things are happening, and I think it's really important that it's happening with mainstream doll makers and toy makers. We, we want to try and evaluate this, so we did some um, research with um, Sean Jones, who's a professor at um, Queen Elizabeth, and she proved that playing with toys for just three minutes that positively represented children with disabilities raised the confidence and self-esteem of those disabled children and blew the open minds of their non-disabled peers, which is what it's about. Isn't it? It's about it's all learning. So just a few examples, we go to hospitals, we go to hospitals, that's me, New York Hospital, that's the pictures in Scarborough Hospital. That says when we received our award, we have been very happy with the 50K. Um, and it's very nice to be rewarded for that work. So we've done a lot um, in our own time and it, all the money goes back into toilet me. And we were invited also to the Play Well um, exhibition and workshops at the Wellcome Trust, which was great fun and fantastic to see Toy Like Me as part of the history of toys. Uh, that was quite a special moment, um, so it was wonderful to be involved in that. And most recently, we are embarking on our preschool show. So mix mups, as you can see here. Little, three little furry creatures, three little furry friends. One is a guide dog owner, one's a wheelchair user, and this being who's the youngest of them all. It's quite exuberant. So we're working on this at the moment because we really want to continue to change the status quo. It's not good enough just to have a few toys. Children love um, preschool television. It's where it starts. If they can see positive images of um, people with guide dogs or wheelchairs or wheelchair users, then it's important it starts there. So that's what I'm busy doing at the moment, and so watch this space. So as I was thinking about what to say today, I didn't dare look at anything well-being, so I didn't want it to colour me in, in terms of what I would say. But at this point, I did look at five ways to well-being. And it really made me giggle, because most of these things I realised happened to me, and I didn't realise that they were the five ways to well-being. 
um, I've realised with the mix mops, their um, strap line is there is always another way. And I think there always is, and you have to find your way. So my pathway to positivity has been quite playful and trans-centric. Yours will be totally different, but I needed to feel connected. It's on here to be listened to. I needed to be active. I needed to do something. I didn't want to just be passive. Having the information allowed me to stop and take notice of the simple things um, in Fred's development and take a real joy when we started to fall and move and smile and not be worried about what might what happen. And the learning, you know, I really want, was hungry for learning, so that was really helpful to me. And the fact that all of these has helped me give something back. Um, I didn't do it for anybody else, really, but myself. But in the way, I think we have done it for lots of people. So the toilet really has changed, uh, has influenced, and I hope that all the stuff that does have a ripple effect. You know, you put a pebble, it goes out into the rest of the puddle. I hope that um, the work I have done does that. Um, I was going to stop there, and then I was like, well, it's no good sorting this out now when the whole of the, oh, the rest of the world, society, hasn't sorted it out. And maybe one of the people feelings why I'm feeling so stressed and anxious is that society hasn't got it right. And I think so, I'm going to spend the next few slides just looking at the societal structures, because it, make, it, make the diff it makes a difference to me around how I view myself. So... Excuse the bad language, but I wanted to explore why we feel the way we do and, and accept that we can't control what people say. You know, it might really annoy us, but we can't control what we can control our response to it. And why do people treat disability in the way they do? Like this guy here, can I ask what it's like to be tragic baby in society? I think it only what it's like to be such a patronizing, <laughs> so true. Um, so I wanted to look at these three models first. So here we have the tragedy of the charity model around disability. It's the pity me, that's what I call it. Now I know, um, you know charities do wonderful work and have been some great support and work through um, specific charities. And they are born out of the personal tragedy model. But some of them are still there. So the fact that disability is considered a tragedy and society needs to take care. So no wonder people come and offer you that sympathy because it's what they've been born up with. And, you know, when Fred walked, it was, oh, it's amazing. It's, it's like, actually, no, it's not amazing. He's just doing his thing in his way. And that's where we get the pity me, oh, bless him. And I, somebody actually said this to me. Oh, he's got such a nice smile. So shame I never see it. It was like, really? Did you really have to say that? And understanding the pity me model helped me put pity me in one place. So I can cope with it now a little better. Um, the... Next model was the fix me model. Now we always come to this um, quite early on because it's a diagnosis. So we're in hospital and we get this diagnosis. And this is the fix me model. So we have pity me and fix me. So the medical model of disability puts people, it, it defines people by their medical diagnosis. And it's all about what you can't do, you can't walk, you can't see, um, it's confined to needs help. Um, it makes the problem being with the disabled person, which is really unhealthy um, and makes doesn't value yourself anymore. So, you know, if you try glasses, I've been told a million times, no, I hadn't thought of that. Wow, well, thanks. Um, they don't get that his rest of mind, but he can see because it's not black and white. So the fix me model, I didn't find very useful. I found the social model, fix it model, to me, fix me, fix it model, um, a bit more useful because it wasn't about um, my child was the problem, it was about the environment as a problem, so what are the barriers to him accessing education or play or the attitudinal barriers. So it was, it was really useful to explore that and I thought it was a really positive way forward and it is, you know, we're going through such transition at the moment, but it made me realise it added to my anxiety because it was about me being a warrior mum now, so smashing down those barriers, you know, challenging people with their attitudes, which we like to do sometimes. But it's stressful and so that model is a little bit helpful but not as helpful as the next model. The next model, the affirmative model, um, and so about pity me, fix me, um, fix it. Now this I just like to call the me model because we are the change. That little boy there, the first one we walked in this garden here. 
and then we had a change, so he's been blind since birth. So this is who I am, this is me, I don't try and change me. So the impairment is the problem at all, it's the known stereotype of the little blind boy, whatever your disability is. And that we need to challenge that view that disabled people want to be fixed, or indeed can be fixed or cured, because if you can't, where does that leave you? We challenge the notion of normality, who's normal? Um, and for people to take control over their own care and have a real positive identity being disabled or differently abled. That's what Tom Lee tries to do. I realised that it's all from an ableist perspective out there, um, which only will change if disability seems a spectrum of all different types of people. So what we're trying to do with Tom Lee and um, the new mix months is create a new narrative um, to give people a more positive response when it comes to change. Because it's difficult to manage change. Disability is a change from the norm. When we encounter it, we have a set, a set of responses that's based on our history. So the pity me model, the charity model. We tend to be curious. Oh, how far can we see? I'm inspired by it. Amazing. Or fearful of it. Oh, my neighbour actually said, this was this is my worst nightmare being blind. I like that. Or pity it less. Yeah. So the affirmative model respects the fact that um, the child person is the change and they can lead that change if we support them. And it all goes back to my beliefs of having children in the driving seat and listening to children. So here literally Freddie's in the driving seat of our go-kart and I like this image because it reminds me of Mario Kart. You know when you're behind Mario Kart and you can throw bombs and banana skins? Well I feel sometimes like the person behind you and there are bombs blowing up in our faces and sometimes I throw them, sometimes other people throw them and there are banana skins that we slip on. But we get there in the end, you know, it doesn't have to be first. And that if we let our child take the lead, we can learn a lot from them. And that's what I try to do, and especially this year as Fred moves into um, secondary school next year. I just want to leave you on this quote from my friend Becca. Um, I love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who doesn't? But she came up with this, and I just love it. I'm just going to read it. Golden ticket baby, that's what Fred is. A child with a disability who flutters randomly into your life, carried by the ruler of genetics or chance, bringing with them the unexpected cries of fun, adventures into new territories you never even knew existed or thought you'd venture into. That really sums up our life. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of you today um, or in the um, retreat or contact me through Twitter, me or Facebook. Thank you.